Hi again, class. Uh, this is a slightly early posting of next week's uh, tutorial practicum, um, the week that I'll be gone for a workshop. Um, and the topic is interpolation. Uh, before I get started about this, I just want you to pay attention to this, all right? This is uh, your textbook over here. Chapter six has all the math. So if you really want to look at the math, you can read through chapter six and you can look at the equations. Hey, I'll put this right up to the screen. There you go. Um, you don't need to know really any of that to make this work. Okay, so if you've read through chapter six and you're feeling a little overwhelmed about this topic, don't worry. The math behind interpolation can be extremely difficult to, to understand, but actually the concepts are relatively simple once you wrap your mind around it. And this is a very important uh, topic to, to actually know something about because nearly all raster data is interpolated in some way. Nearly all, not all, but nearly all. Especially all elevation data that we get is typically interpolated through a series of point data, discrete data gathered at specific parts of the Earth's surface and interpolated to make a smooth surface. Now we will get to that and we will deal with elevation data, but actually first, I think it's probably easier to start with some other kind of point data and to, sh to, sh to start with um, displaying information encoded in the table. So let's start, um, I'm in my Project 3 directory still in Wadi Al Hasa. Let's just add uh, the Wadi uh, WHS sites uh, uh, point file. So I gotta hit the proper uh, add vector layer and then look for WH sites and we'll just click OK and we got all of these dots right here um, and we can look at the attribute table and we can see attached to it are several columns of data many of them are numeric a few of them are categorical text data over here uh, we have let's say one in, uh, column that's particularly interesting let's say maximum length that's this max L column here and we can scroll through it and we can actually look at the at the numbers in there. Now one thing you all know how to do now over in QGIS is to make a thematic map uh, using data in a, in a table. And we did that for our Kurgans over in Kazakhstan. Well, let's do the same thing for our sites data here in uh, Wadi Hasa. And we'll make a thematic map of maximum length of the site. Um, so I'll leave this table up over here in the corner. And we could potentially try and randomize colors from this menu that over here, um, random colors according to category number, but that's not really what we want to do. Uh, instead what we want to do is to be able to have the same control over our categorization that we had in QGIS by making some breakpoints or using a statistical algorithm to create breakpoints. And to do that, instead of adding vector map layer as we normally do, we go to the one right next to it which is, doesn't have the little plus sign as this little, I don't know what this symbol is supposed to be, a little, maybe a blue arrow or something like that. And you click here, and let's click the add thematic chloropleth vector map layer. And you get a similar um, interface, but with some more options over here. So the first thing we need to do is to pick the, si uh, the sites map that we're gonna use, WH site, and we gotta pick our attribute column that we want to categorize. Now this, particular one has to use numeric data, all right? So we'll pick max L because we know it's a, a numeric data column, not a text column over here. And we have to decide our colors, but first we have to decide how many classes we want to do. So let's just sort of scroll through our colors over here. Some of them are pretty big, I mean our, our numbers over here, 100, 200, 300, then we have some small ones, one, and then we have some 20. So let's say maybe we can break into four categories, all right? So before we add the colors, let's go to the tab that says classes. And we can uh, do a couple of different things over here. The simplest one is to use an algorithm, but we still have to define the number. So let's pick four, and let's pick an algorithm. We could have an interval, standard deviation, equal breaks. Let's pick four standard deviations, because that's a nice statistical measure. Now, we have four classes that we're going to define which means back here on the required tab, we have to put four colors in here. And we could just type these out, red, yellow, blue, green, or we could go through and just pick some colors here. So let's just do that since it's pretty simple. We'll click one red, we'll go back in, 
we'll click orange and we'll go back in we'll click yellow and we'll go back in and we will click uh, let's go I don't know pink okay so red orange yellow pink now these three numbers here 255 colon 165 colon uh, zero are RGB values for a specific colors uh, you can Access standard colors with the names that you think of them, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. You can just write those in and grass will interpret those. Or if you know a very specific color value you want, you can go to an online color table for HTML or something like that. You can get the uh, RGB values for red, yellow, green, blue, and you can pick them more specifically. It's easy enough to go in here. You can pick any color that you want like this, and it will put the RGB value there. Now, that's one too many colors, so I'm going to delete that last one. And um, we could pick, uh, uh, finally, a different symbol than an X. I'll pick uh, a square right here, and I'll leave the symbol size at 5 for now. And I can hit Apply, and now we get our um, sort of chloropleth map, our color variant map. Um, we can increase the symbol size as we've done other times. Let's go to 11 so we get a better sense, so we can see the colors a little bit better. And... Um, we could create a legend as well. Uh, actually, I think we can do that over here and vector legend and click apply. And then we can move that actually over here. There we go. Actually, click OK to get rid of that. So these are our vector sites over here. Well, we can uncheck that one to get rid of the, the little X's from before. So this is pretty much what you're used to. Um, we could change this a little bit. So for example, under the classes tab, instead of standard, um, we can delete that and we could put in our own breaks up here. So we could put like two less than two, uh, 10 and above, let's say 30. So those are our breaks and that will, three breaks will create four classes, okay? So we'll hit apply over here and now we get slightly different color ranges uh, over here. And we could change that we could say, okay, Let's do uh, 10, 30, and 100, all right? Because that might be a better, more interesting thing. We can hit apply, and we'll get our new break over here. 1 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 100, uh, and then 100 to the maximum site over here. So that's all pretty standard. That's stuff that we're used to. now. This is perfectly um, intelligible, except for the places where things overlap. Maybe we want to interpolate this point data, these discrete measurements, to a surface of maximum length that varies across the whole valley. Um, this may or may not be a useful thing for maximum length, but there are some categories or some attributes that make more sense to interpolate to look at as a surface rather than as um, Oh, rather than as just uh, uh, colored dots on a map. And uh, it's up to you as the analyst to figure out if the value needs to be interpolated or can be looked at better in this particular manner. I'm just going to use this because it's a column of numerical data. So let's, uh, uh, just so we can get an example of, of how to interpolate uh, a map. So the way we do this, uh, uh, firstly, before we, we get into the mechanics, is to decide exactly how we want to interpolate one uh, data value to a surface. So I have here, uh, let's go back to zoom, I have over here uh, a little graphic, and I'll put this up on the blackboard for the site, um, that helps you understand the different methods of interpolation. Uh, let's start with the 1D uh, examples up here and then we'll talk about the 2D examples down here in a little bit. Um, imagine uh, you've got two data points, this uh, sort of brown one and this green one over here. And you've got a gap between them in space. So whatever uh, interval you gathered your data, remember you're sort of stuck a little bit with that interval. If it's every 20 meters, then your data is 20 meter resolution data. However, we can use statistical modeling to 
we have an educated guess as to what a value somewhere between the one data point and the other data point ought to be. The simplest way to do this is to say whichever data point is closer to your new place that you want to guess the value, just use that value. That's called nearest neighbor analysis. Whatever neighborhood point is closest to the X and Y location I want to fill in the gaps, we just take that value and stick it into our new data point. And you can see that over here. This black new point is the one we want to guess, and it's much closer to the brown point than to the green point, so we literally just get the same value from the brown point and we stick it in there. Now, this is good for discrete data like photographs, for example, where color values should be kind of distinct between them, maybe, let's say, if they're categorical anyway. That's a pretty good uh, a way of doing it. But you get this step, right? Pretty hard step between one area and the next area. So it's not great for super continuous data types. Let's go to the next example over here. We have our same two data points, our brown and our green, and our same new data point, exactly the same distance between the brown to the black. Instead, we're using a linear interpolation, which draws a straight line between the brown and the green line. And wherever this new black point falls on that line, that's the value we're going to put. If it was perfectly between them, it would be exactly the average value, that the one half the distance between this number and that number. If it's a little closer to the brown, it'll be a little below that perfect average value here in the center. It would be closer to the brown, but not exactly the same. That's really important. This is mathematically fairly simple. Linear uh, interpolations are pretty simple. It's just your mx plus b slope alg algorithm for a, a linear regression between this point and that point. Um, that might be fine for some things. It's, it's fast. But you can imagine how that makes a sort of peak and valley, you know, very jagged kind of um, uh, uh, surface. Um, you really what you would end up with is what we call a triangulated surface, one that has faces and peaks. Uh, reality is that certain values are probably more curvilinear, right? You get this sort of smooth, sinuous movement into and out of uh, different uh, uh, values as you go across a landscape or something like that. So that's when we talk about cubic or higher order interpolations. And Really what we have here uh, are our same two data points. We have a couple different new data points, a, a red and a blue. And you can see how the cubic interpolation creates an algorithm with uh, several terms in it, with exponents, etc., to create a smoothly varying line, uh, sometimes called a spline, between all the data points, like so. You see? and we get our same black data point and we put it in the same way along this line but what we see is because the 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 value of the line is now gradually transitioning our interpolated value for this black point is actually a little bit less than our linear line over here but more than our 1D nearest neighbor right so this may be a more realistic way to do interpolation so very often we choose cubic interpolation methods uh, because the surfaces they produce are probably a little closer to that in reality. Uh, the problem with cubic uh, interpolation is that, one, it takes a lot more com computational power, and two, depending on the algorithm you use, you can relax the curves too much and you will have what we call overshoots. So, for example, you will uh, potentially go from this point to this point, it might go under, and it might go over, right, as you try and fit this spline to a landscape. Uh, this 1D example is clear, but look at these 2D examples when you have uh, not just along one line, but in two-dimensional space. You have these other points over here, and you start to see how complicated it gets um, between nearest neighbor, bilinear, and lines in two directions, and eventually bicubic, which is cubic splines in all directions. And you can start to see that, A, the complication of the, the equation goes way up, so the computational time is going to go up, and B, um, the, the, the potential for overshoots with all those new data points also goes up. So very often your cubic interpolations have to be tuned, and you kind of have to know what you're doing, um, and sometimes you have to do a little bit of trial and error to get a good um, interpolation fit.
So that's sort of the theory behind this. Let's look at exactly how we do an interpolation in GRASS. Um, basically, we go up here to our raster menu, even though we're starting with vector points, and we go down to interpolate surfaces over here. And we have a couple of different options. We have vSurf B-spline, which is probably the most useful one. Um, we have inverse distance weighted, which is pretty similar to nearest neighbor analysis. We have generation of contours. We have RST, regularized spine tension, which is one that I personally use a lot because I understand it perhaps a little bit better. And we have a few other things over here. So let's just start with vSurf B-spline. Now, before we start doing all of this stuff, um, we have to talk a little bit about raster resolution, right? If we go up here to our settings menu and we go to show computational region, we will look at this value right here, north-south resolution, east-west resolution. It is currently set to 30 meters. Whatever value you set your raster resolution, your computational resolution at, is the resolution of the output map that's going to be made. So let that sink in a little bit. If I've got 30 meters by 30 meters in here, then whatever map I make in my interpolator, it's going to be 30 meter by 30 meter resolution. That may be perfectly fine. You may want to coarsen that up or fine that up. And the way you do that is to go to uh, settings, computational region, um, set region, g dot region and then you pick the tab that says resolution and right here you enter a value 20, 30, 40, whatever. I'm going to leave this alone for now to be essentially the uh, 30 meters by 30 meters. However, also the thing that's important are these bounds, these values north, south, east, west. Whatever bounds you have set right now, your interpolation routine is going to try to match those bounds. Now, if we get out to the area where there are no data points, that's probably not very good. So one thing that we might want to do, for example, is to set the bounds to match an existing map. In our case, let's just set it to match this vector map instead of the entire Wadi Hassa region, because we don't have points across the entire Wadi Hassa region. So we'll pick this set region to match a vector map, WHS, We'll go to the resolution tab and we'll put 30 just to keep that at 30. And we'll go to the print tab. We will put print current region. And when we hit run, we will see that the bounds have changed a little bit from over here. And our ignore the fact that this gives 29.97. It's 30, all right, is how it's set. So that's all pretty good. Um, let's go back to our vSurf B spline and deal with our vector interpolation. So pick our WHS sites and we'll find our attribute column in the setting tabs. Uh, right here we'll find max length, the same column we have up over here. And we could potentially make uh, steps. Over here what we're going to do is to keep this uh, 30 and 30, the same as our resolution. Uh, we'll start with bilinear because it's pretty fast. And we will give a name right here for our output raster map. And we will call this maximum site length, right? Whoops, spell that correctly. Maximum site length. And there are a few other things over here we could choose. Again, looking in the manual for this will give us a bunch of really good information about some of this stuff. Right now, I'm just going to leave everything else pretty much at its default values, okay? So now I'll just hit run and it will process. It may take quite a bit of time on your computer. Again, this is a fairly computationally intensive um, operation to do. And so you see it's gonna break it down to 54 subregions and take its sweet time doing it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pause the video for a second and let this thing run out uh, and then come back when it's finished. Okay, we are back and our uh, vSurf B-spline routine has finished. You see, basically what it did is in order to process the map more efficiently in the memory, it broke the map into 54 subregions. Now, this is something that we should have paid attention to. We could have increased the memory usage over here and would have broken it down to smaller or larger subregions, probably done it a little bit faster. 
of course, what happens when I do these tutorials is I often go through some of this stuff a little too quickly. Um, again, this is why I encourage you to read the manual. There is a, uh, a fairly common saying in the computer world, RTFM, which is to read the insert expletive here manual, right? You get a lot of questions from people, well, how do I do this and this and this? Did you read the manual? It's in the manual, all right? So basically, we could have optimized this procedure quite a bit more had we read the manual carefully before doing this. Um, but at the moment, what we did is we, we, we had it uh, run while I was paused, and this is it. And you may be looking at this result and saying, uh, that looks like nothing. And it is because, uh, it does look like nothing because of the color scheme, all right? Remember, we have some values, some of which are really big. 1,200 must be this side over here. So if we put our... Um, if we put our little guy or uh, thematic map on top, we do see that this particular site down here is one of the big ones over here. So that means our color scheme may not be able to fit into or fit all of the data because there might be a lot of them that are small. So if we pick our query tool and we query around, we will see that our value is changing. We can look over here at where it says value, this right here is the query around, but it's all showing up as purple. So what we need to do is to create a better color scheme. So I'll just right out, click on my uh, interpolated map, set color table, go to the define tab, and what I can do is to very simply click, click histogram equalization, and oops, I have to click a well, color to uh, scheme to apply. I'll pick this blue, cyan, yellow, red, and boom, there we go. Now, what we can see are some um, gridding artifacts due to the fact that we broke it up into 54 grids. And again, we would have done better to have tuned our uh, interpolation routine to not do that uh, or to minimize that. But now you can start to see how the values uh, uh, have been mapped to a raster uh, map from our original thematic map to a raster map over here. And we can Sorry, oops, we can add here a raster legend for our, um, our map that we just made, maximum site length. And uh, what we should be able to see then is a color for that. Now, for some reason, this is showing up to minus 12 and none of the colors are here, but you get the idea, okay? Um, so this is one application of uh, interpolation. Um, another one could be to just increase the resolution of a raster map. So let me actually get rid of this particular raster legend over here. Let's just pick our uh, SRTM and we'll put this guy off to the side over here and we'll remove this map like this and we will uh, remove that legend over here and we will put our Wadi Hasa 30 meter SRTM right here. Okay, so we're zoomed in a little bit. In fact, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit more like so, so that my computer doesn't slow down doing this. Again, interpolation is an incredibly um, intensive process over here. So what we'll do here is we'll go to our tool that says set computational region extent from display and we'll limit our analysis to just the part of Wadi Hasa that I happen to zoom in over here. Now, if we uh, again display our region settings, we'll see that we are set at 29 by 29, basically 30 by 30 meters, okay? Let's say we wanted to increase the resolution of our raster map to 10 by 10. Now remember, we can't get data that doesn't exist. We gathered the data at 30 meters, that's the resolution. But what we can do is use interpolation to uh, estimate the values that fall between our uh, initial measured locations on the ground. So instead of 30 by 30, we can estimate 10 by 10 by 10 between one 30 meter real measure uh, variable, a real measured point, and another 30 meter distant real uh, measured variable point. Right? So there are a couple different ways that we can do this, but probably the easiest one is to go to uh, develop raster map and then click resample using either B spline or I'm going to show you with spline tension RST over here. 
and what we can do is to just set a new resolution to 10 and 10. So my 30 meter SRTM is selected by default because I have it highlighted over here, but otherwise I could pick it from my list over here. And over here we'll put our uh, Hasa 10 meter DEM, right? We could uh, at this point also create slope aspect and uh, profile curvature. That might be something you want to do if you're going to do that anyway. You know, kill multiple birds with one stone, although try not to kill any poor little innocent birds, all right? And we could use masks and that kind of stuff, which I haven't talked about. Um, but again, if you read the manual over here, you can learn all about that kind of stuff. And here we go. We hit run. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Ahead of myself right now. We have to go back to our G region and reset our region to match 10. Remember I told you whatever region uh, resolution settings we set over here will be propagated through to the other side. So let's, um, I, oh, this one you actually have to set the input uh, resolution to match our input map. So let's start by doing that over here. Set to match Wadi Hasa, hit run. So now it's exactly 30 meters. All right, and then we'll go back over here and set the region from display. And now we can do this and it will work. And because I've zoomed in, this is going to happen a lot faster. If we were doing the whole region, you might want to go grab a coffee or something at this particular point. And there we go. All right. So now we have a Hasa 30 meter. Now if we run uh, 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 G region dash P, which is this computational region show region settings over here. It still says 30, but if we set computational region to that selected map and we do the same thing again, sorry, computational region dash P, now we see it's actually 10 meters. And if we zoom way in until we might be able to see some of the pixel, which is not really showing up on my map over here, we would actually be able to see potentially a difference in resolution. So let's see if we can see so here we see some 30 meter pixels. I hope you can see that on your um, screen. And when we show the 10 meters, we see less pixelization. So one way to actually double check this, so let's zoom out just a little bit, is in the 3D view. So I have both my 30 meter and my 10 meter selected and I go to the 3D view over here and I can go over to my data tab and I can see that I actually probably have both of them here. So let's set this to its uh, uh, oops, finest resolution, down like so. And we'll start to see some pretty strange artifacts over here. And that's because we actually also have our 30 meter uh, DEM over here. And it will show up as really gridded surface over here. And one thing we can do is to pull them apart. So I have both surfaces loaded in here. And when they're set to the current finest resolution, which is 10 meters, you can really see the difference, right? So if I kind of zoom us in from a different angle like this, and I zoom us a little closer, and I bring the height down a little bit, and I pull our maps up like so, you can really start to see the difference. This is our original 30 meter. When we display it at 10 meters, we see this really stepped uh, value between one 30 meter plateau and the next 30 meter plateau. But our interpolated 10 meter surface has estimated values between our original steps, and so it makes a nice smooth transition. And because we did it with essentially a cubic style of interpolation, it's very smooth. The, the surfaces are very, very smooth. Now, and we could tune that smoothness if we wanted to, again, reading the manual for our different interpolation um, routines to figure out exactly how well or how smooth we want to do this relative to the input data points. Now that's all really cool. Let's do one final, um, one final interpolation style of interpolation, and I'm going to set my computational region back to match the entire Hasa region. Um, and what I'm going to do is to do basically just a pretty simple density map, a density map for sites from our Wadi Hasa survey. Now this is pretty useful. This is literally just figuring out the density of input points. And it could be any kind of input point you want. 
Um, but in our case, it makes sense because we have sites and we want to know what is the site density across the Wadi Hassan region. And to do that, we'll go back down to our um, uh, raster menu over here and we'll go down to generate services, not interpolate services, but generate services. And we will go to Gaussian kernel density service, right? What a kernel is, is a moving window that moves across the landscape and just counts the number of things that are in it, all right? And so basically what we have to do is to pick the input vector map with points that we want to count, to pick an output map name, site densities, site densities, right? We'll just make that WHS sites, sites densities, and then to pick a, a size for our moving window. And again, this is scale dependent, all right? The size of the moving window will create slightly different densities. So you need to be cognizant of the scale of the research that you want. So in my particular case here, what I'm going to do is to do a, about um, a 500 by 500 meter, right? 500 by 500 meter um, radius, OK? And really, that's basically it. We could, again, read the manual and figure out um, some other things that we could do over there. And we could pick different functions of this. But let's just run this as a Gaussian uh, 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 sort of normal distribution window. And let's just hit Run. And there we go. Pretty quick over here. So you see what we have here. So let's set our, um, uh, our legend to match our WHS site densities. And click OK. And we have, um, make those fonts white. What we have here are some very small numbers, all right? So 500 by 500 was probably too small of a, um, a moving window. So let's up this to a one kilometer by one kilometer. Go to our optional tab and uh, out, allow over uh, writing of output files. And now we see, ah, so now we see a slightly different, right? And if we go back to our basic tab, and we increase this, let's say, to five kilometers, like so. We hit run. It takes a little longer. The bigger the moving window, the longer the routine is going to take. And now we start to see um, different values uh, uh, over here. And um, this is giving you a sense of how the scale makes a difference for this particular routine. Um, one thing that we could also do is to change it from Gosh into, let's say, a uniform distribution at five kilometers and we will get a slightly different output over here, all right? So again, read through the manual to understand the difference for what those things mean. So they have, for example, some notes over here, and um, that will help you figure out which value you want to use. Um, but you can see, basically, that can be a very, very useful uh, uh, routine to run. Uh, just to count the numbers of points in, in little areas. All right, I think that basically does it for interpolation. So I'll be gone next week, um, but we can talk about this the following week just so you can ask me any questions you might have. Uh, see you then.